we um we have a little bit of a plan we're gonna go back and forth um and not bore you like that's the whole idea is that you will not be bored so if we see people that look a little bored maybe i'll call your name or something like that i don't know um but i'm gonna share a little bit about me then trey's gonna go the, and back and forth like that and then we're gonna talk about some books so i am gonna start just by telling you um that i grew up um in a really white environment like super duper white had no idea how white until a lot later in my life and i'm still kind of unpacking that as i look back and and see um i was born in dayton ohio you might have heard of that probably not if you're not from dayton, from ohio um and when i that was that's a pretty diverse um city in ohio but when I was in sixth grade, my parents decided that we were going to move back to the town that they grew up in, which is West Liberty, Ohio, which has 2,500 people. And I want to say 2,496 of them, 95 of them <laughs> are white. One of my best friends in high school, his dad was black, his mom was Korean, and that was about as much color as we had in our town. I found out 40 years later, 30 years later, um, that West Liberty was probably what is called a sundown town, which meant that if you were black, you did not want to be in my town uh, after the sun went down. It's not confirmed, but everyone's like, yeah, it pretty much um, was a sundown town. So from there, from my really white high school, I went to a really white Christian, evangelical Christian college, Cedarville College, now university pretty much in the middle of a cornfield in Ohio. Um, and yeah, mostly mostly white people there too. And then I got married to a white guy and had some white kids. And um, my, my life, I started to uh, have a little bit more diverse friendships then, but I, um, I'm not gonna talk much about this because this is also a big part of my past, but I wrote some really white uh, books. You can see all the white people on the front. I'm doing this fast so you can't see the title <laughs> because I don't want you to know or buy those books, which you can still buy. Um, so that's me growing up in a really white environment. And Trey is going to tell you about growing up black. <laughs> yes. 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 So, uh, there are so many of you. Uh, to, there's so much for you guys to learn. I'm going to tell you all about growing up black. Uh, <laughs> nah, nah, uh, <laughs> I can't wait. I'm so yeah, yeah, I, I I did. I grew up real, real black. Um, as a matter of fact, the majority of the black people in this uh, webinar right now, as I scan these faces, are biologically related to me. Uh, my mother's here, my sister's here. There, there is one uh, 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 skin folk who is not kin folk uh, on on this call. So, uh, what's up, Agent? I appreciate you joining us. Uh, but yeah, like we we was we was real black and black on purpose, and I didn't feel any sort of way about it. Um, because I was in. We started out in New York City, which um, there's no shortage of black people there, surrounded by black, went to black churches. I was in a black school, in fact. Uh, when I moved to Richmond, Virginia, at the time it was a majority black city. Um, I was in a black school there until eventually I was transferred into uh, a private school, or I was enrolled in a private school uh, that was not predominantly black. I was one of three black people in my graduating class, me, Malcolm Dante, that was it. Um, and, and I had an opportunity to study, uh, many of you in your natural ha habitat, uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> through that, <laughs> through that experience, um, I, I learned, uh, a lot about what it is to, to navigate, uh, life from a couple different sides, right? What Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois would call, um, the double consciousness that a lot of black people navigate, uh, life in America with. And, um, for that reason, I, I recognize that the the normal lens through which people view America is like it's pretty white, right? Like it's it's, it's white. I don't, I don't know how else to describe it. Uh, but my my family, my parents were also very intentional about making sure I knew that my history was different, right? My father was a Jamaican immigrant. Uh, my mother has, uh, she's from New York, has roots in the American South, all these things. So all these different factors play in. Um, and and uh, there, was, there was some confusion, culture shock when I first went to this other school, uh, but you know, code switching eventually becomes second nature to you. And, and 
after a while you get grown and confident enough, you can pretty much say and do what you want. And that's where I am right now. So I think that, that was the crash course. Y'all now understand everything about what it is to be black in America. Congratulations, you graduated. Y'all woke now. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Trey. That was so great. Um, and Naya and Gracia are here, and they are very black, and you just can't see their faces because oh, there we go. I'm sorry. <laughs> I saw the names too. I'm sorry. I was I was scanning. I didn't mean to erase nobody in this room. That was not anybody mine. else black. Want to yell at Trey? <laughs> yeah, no. I'm just kidding. No, we yes. Thank you for the crash course. That was awesome. Okay, so next thing that we are going to learn, and this again, this is all going to be very abbreviated because we could be here talking about ourselves forever, and that's not the point. Um, but the next part for me then is waking up to to racism and to white supremacy. And um, I didn't start here, but in around 2009, 10, I um, along Along with my ex-husband, we helped a black pastor friend and his wife start a multi-ethnic church in Columbus, Ohio. And funny story that I won't go into, but Trey and I just found out right before <laughs> we got on here that um, we, uh, well, I know Pastor Rich Johnson very, very well, and he knows of him. Um, he's connected to him in different ways. So, so that's pretty cool. So that was, that was the, the first time that I was seriously, deeply in relationship um, with a lot of black people, other people of color. Um, and it was, it was a real, it, it was really, really great. It was really a, a really, it was, it was a, it was a cool thing. Um, but it wasn't until 2012 when Trayvon Martin was killed. And one of my friends who was black uh, wrote on Facebook, why are none of my white friends talking about Trayvon Martin? And I, I didn't know what she was talking about, so I Google it, and that led to a whole lot of things where I, I, I didn't know. I did not know about police brutality, mass incarceration, all this stuff. It just keeps going back and back, and I'm finding out how, how clueless I was, how much in a bubble that I was. Um, and then right around that time, my ex-husband had a heart attack at the age of 34. Uh, he almost died. We lost our house. We lost he lost his job um, and we had to move into low income housing. And it turned out that it was in um, an area, right? It was actually right, really close to our house, but it was uh, primarily Somali refugees and some other people from Nepal and Mexico, Eritrea, there were some black families who are from the U S and that really, um, it, it changed, it changed my life even more. We moved to Cambodia as, missionary and then in january of 2022 trey started a newsletter and i think maybe trey you might have been one of the first people i knew of that was starting a newsletter so back in the day everybody blogged and i followed all these blogs i blogged for years um but i don't think i was really i don't think i had subscribed to any newsletters until yours so trey starts oh, wow. his newsletter the sun do move and so i subscribed to that and I think it was in January, like maybe one of the first posts that I, that you wrote and I replied or commented and I was like, you are a really good writer <laughs> and not like in a surprised way, but I was serious. And then I think I told him later, like, I don't just say that to people. Like I, I have been reading books forever and I have been writing books for a long time and I recognize good writing when I see it and you are like, you're a really good writer. And my personal preference for things that I'm gonna write, I want three things. It doesn't have to be all of them all the time, but I want you to be smart. I want you to be funny. And I want you to be convicting. Like I, I want <laughs> like that, that combination I, I love. So that's like my favorite kind of people to read. If you're smart and funny and you're saying something that you really believe and you are persuading me at least to see your side, even if I don't end up believing what you believe. And so that's what I saw in Trey's writing. And I remember like, I, I couldn't tell sometimes, Trey, if you were being like, you're like, really? Am I really a good writer? And I was like, no, really. Like, I, I wanted to shake you and be like, I, I, you have this gift. Like, I, I don't know how to explain it exactly. But you, I just saw something there that is like, just 
<laughs> I, I don't know. I just wanted you, not that you were going to stop writing if people didn't encourage you, but I needed you to know. I would have. I'm a quitter. Deeply... I'm a quitter. I would. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> and so we went back and forth on on that. For, that's how, that's what our, the extent of our friendship was for a while was just like, let's talk on Twitter every once in a while and I'll talk to you on your newsletter and talk about writing. At some point, um, <clears throat> we, uh, I don't know when this was, and you've talked about it a couple of times, Trey, but I don't know if you know when exactly it was when I told you, you needed to write a book, this needs to be in a book. And again, I don't say this to everybody. I'm not going around telling everybody that they need to write a book. Like I'm serious about this. And would, do you want to write a book? And you're like, yeah, I do want to write a book. <laughs> so if you could talk a little bit about you writing a book, like how, how that happened, you don't have to give the whole thing away or whatever, but you do have a book coming out at the beginning of next year now which is going to be pretty awesome and if you don't say enough good things about it then i will just hop in and i will <laughs> i will tell the people <laughs> yeah we're gonna be <laughs> no, um in, in all honesty so uh my mother who is who is on the call hi mom how you doing uh she 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 wrote she wrote books that was that was a thing she did and does um and i was like oh that's kind of cool um, maybe one day I could be like my mom, right? And it was just this, this far off dream. And it's funny because the newsletter, like the mm -hmm. sun to move was actually in my mind going to be the title of a book. And as I was going through this process of developing a book and, and trying to share it with people, I, I got interest from a few publishing houses and I, I've spoken to agents and some of the feedback I got was that the concept was a little nebulous and everything because um, I'm known on Twitter because I joke a lot and, and and then I often like slide into serious topics. It's, it's how I approach life in general, right? Um, humor is, is often a coping mechanism for me because I've endured a lot of depressing stuff, um, but 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 I, but I like I was joking at my father's funeral. I'm that type of guy, while I still recognize the gravity of situations. Um, and and I, I I was having a hard time communicating that that's still what I'm trying to bring, even as I write in in a book. And honestly, um, Marla, who is or biggest influences and encouragers, and telling me that this is something that I can do. Um, you were probably as instrumental as anybody else in helping me crystallize this into something that that sounded like me. Like it wasn't as much of a stretch to be like, oh, where did this come from with Trey? To the point where I, I, I can let this out of the bag now. The foundation of my book is actually tweets. Like every chapter starts with a tweet and then gets expounded upon. And then this other thing. And um, some of that, like it was uh, Jazz Robertson, a friend of mine on Twitter, and Marla actually helped me crystallize that as a plan. Um, and so one of the things I'm excited about is this book feels like an extension of all the work I've already been doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, Katie Cannon has this, this phrase, this idea of doing the work that your soul must have. And um, as I sit down and I start writing this book and everything, in particular, uh, working with David and Lake Drive and the way we're doing it in terms of crowdfunding and everything like that, it feels as though this isn't just me doing art. This is me. This is an extension of the community that I've always envisioned and wanted to build. Um, so I get I get excited about stuff like that for sure. Yeah. Did I answer it's, the question? Um, I don't know if I did it. Yeah. I okay. Said it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you didn't say how awesome the book was, but that's fine. People will see. People know. And that's kind of the thing that what you were just saying about like the humor and that it's funny. I wrote down um, just before we started, I was jotting down some things I wanted to talk about. And I was going to talk about you and I, and me and our talks about you, code switching. Um, and I was like, you, I was thinking to myself, you don't, when you're writing this, I, I wouldn't even call it code switching it's more like code stitching and I was so proud of myself I was like did I make this up and I googled it I did not make it up but in my mind I like nobody told me about it so you're, you're a co-inventor <laughs> but that's what you do because you are not switching between um whether it's talking to white people talking to black people or the funny part of you or the pastor part of you or all the different trays that all come together to one tray. You're not switching as much as you are putting them 
together. And that's where the magic happens in your writing. And so when you've like sent me some things you've written, I've given you some feedback. Um, for example, this, this is the one of the books that we're giving away that Trey and I each have an essay in. And um, Trey actually put this on Twitter, the, or is Trey's essay, um, the other day, because I, I write like all over the stuff. So I'd already read Trey's essay before it was in the book, but then I was like, <laughs> when I read it again, I wrote all this stuff, there's some bad words. Trey put it on Twitter behind the screen so people had to click on it <laughs> hey, man. before they get there. Pass the but, keep it up. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So I'll give one of Trey's secrets away. So Trey wrote an essay for this book and he sent it to me and he's like, what do you think? And I was like, hmm, it's a little bit boring. <laughs> and so literally, I don't remember how long it took you, Trey, but it was like an hour later, maybe later that day. I don't know. He sends it back to me and he's like, how about this? And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like, it was perfect because it was the code stitching like it was the smart stuff the deep stuff the theological stuff the funny stuff like it was all somehow in there and that's what we need and that's what life is and that's who we are and anytime you're not bringing your full self to to your writing it's not like trey has to be funny all the time and everything that he that he writes but if you can't bring your whole self to your writing, then it's not really fully you. And that's the conversation that Trey and I've had over and over again, not just about writing, but about life. And Trey defines love as a commitment to wholeness. And that's the whole thing where if, if, if I'm not committed to someone's wholeness, if I'm not committed to Trey's wholeness, I can't say that I love Trey as a, as a brother. Like I can't, if, if I have, like when I was an evangelical Christian, I could tell people, I could tell my queer friends, I love you, but I can't love the gay part of you because I believe that's a sin. So I can love everything but that. Or my Muslim friend, wrong about your religion. So I can't love that part of you. And a whole lot of just brokenness and not loving the whole person not allowing people to be who they were and so that is kind of the reason one of the big reasons that trey and i are friends when it would seem like we titled this webinar the white agnostic and the black pastor why would we <laughs> why would we, we be friends what do we have in common with each other and the thing we have in common um, we have several things in common, but one of them is that we are both committed to not just each other's wholeness, but to everyone's wholeness and not just Christians and not just whoever, but everyone. We are committed to everyone being whole. And that is what I wrote about in this book that we're also giving away. And it's, it's about that, how as an evangelical Christian, um, a commitment to people's wholeness wasn't really a thing. They had to sign off on my beliefs and, and all of that. And then I could be committed to them, but not really their wholeness necessarily if they had any parts left over that I didn't think fit in. Um, so that's been, yeah, that's that's what I, I love about um, Trey and his writing is just all the ways that he brings his, whole self because there's a lot there's a lot to you <laughs> trey you are um you contain multitudes <laughs> oh, well, i'm simple i'm simple <laughs> yeah no okay so at this point we have a few um okay what time is it it's eight or four We're, david what time did you want to start the q a because i just have a, a few books we were just going to mention a couple things we're not going to talk a ton about individual books that could take a long time but I did make a PDF of about 120 different books that Trey and I think are awesome um, and that we're going to give to everybody 
and you can check those well, out. I think everybody, I think everybody would love to hear just some a, a book from each of you, perhaps if not more than one that that's really fast been fascinating to you, if not formative or something recent. And then yeah, let's let's just open it up for a discussion about what people might be reading and what they're interested in. And you certainly have covered some of the themes that we would be looking for in some of these books yeah. too. Trey, you want to start? You want me to start? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm gonna start. Um, one okay. of one of the books that I've been obsessing over lately, um, just because like stuff stuff gets heavy um <laughs> with with the the world crumbling around us and fascist buying social media networks and pushing them further <laughs> into a hellscape and all sorts of stuff it's like it, it, it's hard to enjoy life so there are times when i have to go out of the way to break up the monotony of my reading and stop reading because i read theological stuff not any of the stuff they assigned at my first seminary because that's all corny and kills my face uh but 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 stuff that, that, that but sometimes i have to go out of the way to also like <laughs> read some fiction right um and and one of the books on our list is uh, an american marriage by tayari jones is a, a dope book deacon king kong by james mcbride is one of like the most hilarious novels i've ever read in my life but um a book named ray bearer by jordan Fueco. it's a it's, it's actually a young adult uh fantasy novel and it actually has it's part of a duology the second one is called redemptor but she crafts this whole like world um it's like an African setting, but it's all fictional. And these kids who are selected by this, this ray, like this, this, this magical force have to run this empire together. And um, it's, it's just so fascinating with like the, the vivid colors and imagination that gets brought into it. And reading stuff like that is important for me because even as a minister and a pastor and a theologian, I am very upfront about the fact that I believe theology is an endeavor in imagination right? Um, we have to be able to put images to, to these concepts about God and about the divine. And that's very difficult to do in a society that slowly but surely chips away at your imagination over time in order to make us productive members of this society and producers and, and things of that nature. Like our, our imagination gets slowly strangled and, and and choked away so reading books like this reminds me of all of the things that we were once capable of when we were younger right can all you remind things. us of the name of the book again too yeah most definitely the one um i'm talking about uh the names of book one and two are the ones i was talking about just now were ray bearer by jordan ifueco and the sequel is called redemptor uh the other two books i mentioned were an american marriage by tayari jones and Deacon King Kong by James McBride. And I know, at, I think three of those are on, the only one of those that won't be on the PDF is Redemptor, the sequel to Ray Bearer um, by, by Jordan Fuego. So all of those books I just named are fiction or fantasy or something like that, uh, just because there's other books on the PDF as well. But sometimes I think it's important that we engage our imagination and, and, and give ourselves a break from the heavier things. That's, that's, that's an important practice of mine at least. Yeah, I love that. I don't read enough fiction. I read a ton of books, like over 200 books a year. And probably uh, maybe 25 of them are fiction, sometimes more. Um, you got to fix the ratio. I know, we do need to fix the ratio. I am actually rereading for the third time right now, The Color Purple. But I'm listening to Alice Walker read it. Audiobooks I have never done before because I get too distracted. But I have the book in front of me. And I'm going along with it. And it's, I, I've, I don't usually underline fiction, but so this is the third time I've read this. And there's stuff, like there's stuff in here, Trey, that reminds me of you. Um, and that's the thing that when I'm talking about connections with books, it's not just like, we, like I have to be reading the same book as someone. I can be reading a book and I'll text Trey and I'll be like this, <laughs> for example, Trey just told me that he got his ears pierced at Claire's. <laughs> And the next day I read in a book that someone got their ears pierced in Claire's. That's why I texted Trey. I was like, look at this. Can you, <laughs> you, know, I, Just... I, you, you want to post it? Yes, my mom is on this call. She didn't know. I wasn't posting your ears pierced yet. You snitching. You oh, dry snitching right now. Oh. I'm sorry. I thought, yeah. We can also tell them one of your middle names that your mama calls you. No, we won't do that either. Um, no, no secret. <laughs> <laughs> but this book 
Trey and I have lots of conversations about God because I don't like God right now, but then Trey will come to me and Trey's not trying to lead me back to the Lord or anything like that, but he will say, this is how I see God. It's a, it's kind of different from the God that you're talking about. And there are some paragraphs in this book. I'm like, oh, that's the God that Trey is talking about, like same as that. Um, and then I'm just going to show like six books. Some of these are my friends and I want you to buy their books. Um, and they're really good. I'm not going to show you any of my friends' books that suck, just the ones that are really good. Scott is on this call right now, and Asian American Apostate by R. Scott Okamoto just came out, and I was on Scott's podcast. It was so much fun. I talked about, it's called Chapel Probation. You should check it out. I have not talked about my small evangelical Christian college in like 20 years. And he brought up all these memories. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, but this book is really, really good. Scott is another one. I will tell you, he is smart. He is funny. And he says convicting things. Faith Unleavened by Tamise Spencer Helms. This, yes. she is wonderful. And I know Naya is on here right now. Naya and Tamise are really good friends. And um, she is a black queer woman who did a whole lot of stuff, gave up her life basically to join a white church and follow white Jesus until she woke up. And she is also another smart, hilarious, wonderful person. Tina Strawn is a friend of mine. And this book is called Are We Free Yet? The Black Queer Guide to Divorcing America. And I just want to read you one thing. If I could read you like 50 things tonight, I would do it. But this is for us white folks. Um, and this chapter is called One Nation Under Black Trauma. And I just want to read this quickly. If black grief can move white folks to want to fight for change, then so be it. But black grief is not on display so white folks can give a fuck. White allies and white friends can care about our black grief and our black suffering and our black trauma. But white validation is unnecessary as it relates to black grief. Black grief is sacred and belongs to black people. Our grief is not for white folks to use as motivational material and has nothing to do with whiteness. We deserve and it is time that we demand to grieve in peace. And a second thing that goes along with that is a new book that just came out today. Another friend of mine, Marcy Alvis Walker, Everybody Come Alive. And I'm gonna read one thing in here and I'll explain why just briefly. The reason I'm reading these things is because as a white woman who is reading a lot of books by black authors, has a lot of black friends, I always want to be super mindful that it is not my place to butt into my black friends' lives, their culture. If they invite me in in some way, then then that's great. If they invite me in a little bit of a way, I'm not pushing in more of a way. And I think that's one thing I'm always trying to tell people that as white folks who are waking up, learning things, we got to do this with humility. We got to listen. We got to keep our mouths closed. And that's why reading books can be such a good thing because we can read with humility with our ears and eyes and keep our mouths closed. This is what... Um, Marcy says in the first chapter of the book, and she, um, I'll just read it. From a very young age, I understood that this good and beautiful blackness was not on display. I learned that its rich marbling throughout my mother's house was not for sale. It was our pearl of great price. So my mother trained me and my siblings not to reveal to our white classmates that we loved fried chicken or enjoyed watermelon. They'll think it's common, she said. Even worse, it makes them think they know the whole interior of your house when all they can see is the edge of the driveway, my mother told me. You don't need to prove that you're black to them. Be a mystery, let them wonder. And so in moving my life between my grandparents and my mother's house, even my preferences and idols code switched. And the last book is A Renaissance of Our Own by Rachel Cargill, another friend of mine, also very, very good book. So those are some of the books that I am loving right now. And I wish that I could just read for a living. I wish that everyone would go buy my book and I would make millions of dollars and I could quit my job and then I could read books for fun and maybe not even write anymore. I don't know. <laughs> I could just read all of them.